So maybe it's this trait that's particularly central to performance in what we might think of as the truly athletic fish species, like the fast swimming tuna or the sailfish that I mentioned earlier, or even long distance endurance swimming, like the Pacific salmon that swims over a thousand kilometers or 600 miles without stopping or eating just to spawn for the very last time. Good evening. Welcome to the spring lecture series here at the New England Aquarium. I'm your weekly host. <laughs> um, I, uh, my name is John Mandelman. I'm the vice president and chief scientist of the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life here at the aquarium, which represents all of our research and conservation work here. Um, about, uh, about eight months ago, we decided that one lecture, I think we maybe decided one per year, was going to be a, a real special lecture where we brought somebody in who was extremely renowned and from a potentially a different part of the world. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jody to our, for our president's lecture, and I'm extremely excited to hear what she has to say tonight. I hope you all are, are as well. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much, John, um, and thanks so much for that warm introduction, and also um, Maggie and the rest of the aquarium for um, the honor and the invitation and the logistics to be here tonight. Um, so as per the title of my talk, you can tell that I'm fascinated by athletes, and globally, of course, um, humans are really fully into the spirit of sport and competition, and it just sort of depends on which country you're from and maybe the season of the year. Um, but perhaps when we think of our famous aquatic athletes, we might think of Michael Phelps, and I put this up on the screen and think, wow, that's a really big image of Michael Phelps there. <laughs> he has 23 career gold medals, 28 Olympic medals in total, and really like one of our thoughts of a legend in his sport, by far the, few, the fastest human in the water. Indeed, the Olympic Games can truly highlight our elite human athletes, but some may argue that humans aren't really built for speed and athleticism in the water. And to put that into perspective, sure enough, Usain Bolt clearly tops Phelps' speed, whether in body lengths or strides per second. But neither of these guys have anything on the fastest land mammal, of course, land mammal, of course, the cheetah. Uh, topping out at over 30 meters per second or about 90 feet per second, which when standardized for their body length, uh, really blows Bolt off the track and Phelps out of the water. So, so here are some of our, our land athletes. And while I'm astounded by the records that are always being just crushed and shattered at the Olympic Games every time and the sheer talent of these athletes, um, there certainly are other animals that have our humans beat, especially if we do move back to the water and we think that the sailfish, pretty much the cheetah of the ocean, perhaps unsuspectingly um, the tiniest fish when corrected for body size, being as fast as 20 body lengths per second. They're right there with the sailfish. So I should also point out that my obsession with fish athletes has been quite contagious amongst my students. And this has become the topic of Adam Downey's PhD thesis. Um, he's already taken some of these ideas really far and I'm, I'm very excited to see where he's gonna go with these fish athletes, especially the larval coral reef fishes. So indeed, these are some of my most famous swimming athletes, my most fav favorite swimming athletes, and the ones I'm most passionate about. I'm a physiologist by training. Try saying uh, fish physiologist three times quickly. <laughs> and essentially I do studies to understand how fish function by definition, and I'm most interested in their form of athletic performance and what it can tell us. So my aim tonight through a few stories uh, is to convey not only the passion that I have and the love that I have for my career, um, but also the interesting science that's resulted from mine and my colleagues and my students' research and the importance of our work collectively to understanding and better protecting places like the Great Barrier Reef where I work, which is very near and dear to my heart, but very much in trouble right now. So 
I'm fortunate that my research does take me to places uh, that are so beautiful, like this one here, um, working with really neat species in places like Australia, and all over the world, really. I have the opportunity to collaborate with some phenomenal scientists worldwide and work in some really incredible locations. And it's really through those connections that I'm here today, as John mentioned, and working over the next few weeks with one of my um, co-supervised PhD students uh, here at the aquarium, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So speaking of which, I do wanna take this opportunity to acknowledge my team of undergraduate and graduate students and technicians and postdocs uh, currently and over the past few years. They're truly my pride and joy and without them, none of this would be happening. Um, oftentimes I don't even know my name without them. <laughs> But some of their research I'll be highlighting and, and mentioning a bit later as well. But one of the biggest questions that I do get asked um, is, is why fish? And well, we're all here at the aquarium, so I probably don't have to convince you that fish are really, really amazing. But of course, fish do have a dominant presence in many aquatic ecosystems because of their size, their mobility. They play critical roles in structuring food webs and many very important ecological processes. And numerous species, as John mentioned earlier, are key to fishing industries and, and ecotourism and the livelihood and sustenance of coastal communities. But also what fascinates me are the numbers. Estimates for the number of fishes are around 28 to maybe 29 to 30,000 species. This means that fish make up over 50% of all vertebrate species on the planet. So that's over half of all animals on the planet today that have a backbone are fish. Fish also occupy nearly every body of water on the planet, spanning the extremes from the Antarctic to desert pools and even habitats with very low oxygen levels. They are quite influenced by changes in water quality and have a tremendous capacity for adaptation. In fact, the fishes have over 400 million years of evolution behind them, and they are referred to as the most successful vertebrates. Based on about a decade of my own and my colleagues' research, we think that their success is related to their unique capacity for oxygen transport into and throughout their body. Therefore, they're really a fantastic group of athletes to investigate the adaptations that will be needed to cope with contemporary issues like climate change. But are they really athletes? So this is one of the um, articles that was written after a paper I published about a year ago and really sparked some questions in terms of what we think of when we think of elite athletes. And as I let off earlier, we often think of the speed of Usain Bolt, and I've been doing a lot of fun things, <laughs> racing um, real fish against Michael Phelps, and this was a really fun piece that I did with the ABC in Australia, um, in Sydney, last year, and we did like all kinds of contests comparing Michael Phelps to real fish and his athleticism, and went really, really well. Um, that month that it was, it was out, it reached about 18 million people. It's a really good way to connect the science to something that everybody was really, really excited about, and the Olympics were happening at that time as well. So you'll have to Google the Superfish Challenge and check out that comparison. And um, I mentioned this earlier today that I did send all of this to Phelps on Twitter and he never responded. So I think he was just, you know, a little, little embarrassed that the little larval reef fish were just kicking his butt. So <laughs> definitely speed, but also endurance and strength and agility. So many traits when we think of what makes a really amazing athlete. And there is one thing, however, that no matter who we are in this room, we all have in common with these elite athletes. And in fact, this is something that we have in common with nearly every animal on the planet that has a backbone from the sailfish to the cheetahs. And that's how we transport oxygen throughout our body. So nearly every vertebrate animal on the planet possesses an oxygen transporting protein in their blood called hemoglobin. In the lungs or in the gills of animals, hemoglobin will rapidly absorb oxygen from the environment that they're breathing, whether it's the air that we're breathing or the water that the fish is breathing. And when that blood arrives to the tissues, 
uh, such as the heart or maybe the muscles, the hemoglobin will release that oxygen to those tissues. Then the blood flows back to our lungs or back to the fish's gills, and the process starts all over again. So if you think about it, nearly every aspect of athletic training comes down to how oxygen flows throughout the body. Blood flow, blood volume, how the respiratory surface, like our lungs or the fish's gills, functions to get enough oxygen from the environment, how the heart pumps to push blood around the body, give oxygen to our tissues that are working really hard, and even how our muscles build strength. In fact, some athletes will even try to trick their bodies by training where there's less oxygen, like at high altitude, so that their bodies will make some of those key adjustments more quickly or to a greater degree. Oxygen transport in athletes and the changes that can be made to enhance performance is a topic that I've been investigating for over the past decade or so now. And of course, this has been in fish, not humans. And as I hinted earlier, there are over 400 million years of evolutionary history. We think that their success as athletes is due in part directly to this oxygen transport mechanism. So what is their secret? Well, the version of hemoglobin that is in fish blood is unique when it's compared to hemoglobin in other vertebrates, other animals with backbones like ourselves. Just a few small changes in the structure of that protein, and the result is that fish can be up to 50 times more effective at releasing oxygen to their tissues than we humans can or even any other air-breathing animal. This information tells us maybe how fish have adapted this very, very important process of getting oxygen and delivering it to their tissues so that they can live in all kinds of conditions, warm or cold water, oxygen-rich or oxygen-poor water, and could really be the key to their success. So maybe it's this trait that's particularly central to performance in what we might think of as the truly athletic fish species, like the fast swimming tuna or the sailfish that I mentioned earlier, or even long distance endurance swimming, like the Pacific salmon that swims over a thousand kilometers or 600 miles without stopping or eating just to spawn for the very last time. And perhaps even the agility and the quick recovery from exercise in other species like those found on our beloved coral reefs. As I mentioned earlier, we think they're especially athletic when they're in their larval stages. These athletes have been training in challenging conditions for hundreds of millions of years, even before the dinosaurs. In fact, the Silurian and the Devonian were known as the age of the fishes. They coincided with quite unforgiving conditions here on the planet, a prolonged period of elevated atmospheric carbon dioxide levels as per the red line on this graph, and very low oxygen levels as per the blue line on this graph. There was a bit of recovery during, um, during these conditions, but then things changed again with the Permian mass extinction. This was approximately 252 million years ago, and the worst of all five of the major mass extinction events that the Earth has faced so far. It was also known as the Great Dying. This truly marked a turning point in the evolution of the fishes. Some fishes were eliminated from the water altogether, moving to land. Those that stayed and would become our modern fishes, they could maintain oxygen transport and performance despite these challenging conditions. They expanded and exploited newly available habitats and via their capacity to effectively transport oxygen, they were also able to make an array of modifications in swimming and feeding, all of which contribute to the fishes being one of the most successful animal groups in all of evolutionary history. So I don't think anyone said it better than Charles Darwin. It's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the most responsive to change, and that the fishes have very much done. But we humans are now changing the planet at an unprecedented rate. Over the past three million years, atmospheric carbon dioxide was always below about 500 parts per million, and sea surface temperatures were no more than about two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial.
But now, here we are. Atmospheric carbon dioxide levels have been over 400 parts per million for over a year now. And these uh, gases are coming from greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. Uh, this is coming from the burning of fossil fuels. And human influence has been so profound since the Industrial Revolution that scientists have now defined a new epoch in the Earth's geological history as being human-influenced or anthropogenic, called the Anthropocene. So based on overwhelming evidence that atmospheric, geologic, hydrologic, biospheric, and other Earth systems are now being altered by humans, and that humans are part of nearly every ecosystem, we have the Anthropocene. And we are changing the climate. So this is the greatest threat to our oceans, to our coral reefs, and therefore to the amazing athletes that are inhabiting them. The increase in these greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere is warming and acidifying the oceans. Many parts of the oceans are experiencing decreases in oxygen, and the increase in industrial and agricultural development is removing crucial habitats for many species and causing poor water quality. Today, we're changing our oceans at a rate faster than has ever been documented in human history. So if I go back to my very first title slide, we can put all of this together. Hopefully, I've already convinced you that the most amazing aquatic athletes are not Michael Phelps, but rather they're fish, but also that we have a serious problem with the conditions that we're creating on the planet. So how are fish coping with the Anthropocene? This has been the big question fueling my research. Will their long evolutionary history and their amazing capacity as athletes be enough to protect them from the large scale rapid changes currently occurring in their habitats? I designed my experiments to assess the effects of climate change on oxygen transport and the key aspects of athletic capacity in fishes. To do this, my team and I execute a lot of controlled laboratory experiments. We investigate an array of species. We use scenarios that are derived from models and predictions for the year 2100. We look at the roughly two to four degrees Celsius increase in sea surface temperatures that's predicted, the 0.3 unit decrease in ocean pH due to increases in carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we look at decreases in oxygen and other scenarios for water quality, where we mainly focus on turbidity from runoff and the effects of suspended sediment at dirty water, essentially, on fish. We've compared various populations from different latitudes and therefore different thermal regimes. We look at extreme habitats. We look at extreme performers. And we also look across development and across generations, ultimately linking changes in performance to changes in behavior, changes in movement, and ultimately changes that could be happening in the distribution of coral reef fishes. And we've been testing athletic performance quite literally by swimming fish under various conditions in this aquatic treadmill. And we take blood samples to determine how efficiently they're transporting oxygen throughout their body. So the fish would be tested under some experimental conditions, whether it be high temperatures or high carbon dioxide levels to simulate ocean acidification or really any other challenging condition. And we would gradually increase the flow of the water against which the fish has to swim. The setup is essentially this aquatic treadmill. Water is coming in from an aquarium. There's flow control. There are several sensors inside the treadmill to monitor water quality also monitoring how much oxygen the fish is using while it's swimming at each speed as it gets progressively faster. This is all logged in real time on the computer. And then, see the video going there? <laughs> as we gradually increase the water flow, the fish will have to work harder and harder to swim and therefore use more oxygen at a faster rate. At some swimming speed, the fish is very efficient but faster speeds will require more energy and more oxygen, and therefore will be more difficult for the fish to maintain.
We'll get to a point where that won't be possible anymore, the fish will fatigue, and the trial will be over. We'll take more blood samples. So this is quite similar to a stress test that you may have um, done on a treadmill at the doctor's office or on a, a stationary bicycle. Um, and for those of you who are athletes and monitoring your athletic capacity yourselves, the test that you do periodically to see how efficiently your body is taking up oxygen, which we often call the VO2 max, you may have heard before. Same idea here. So we can get some really valuable information from this kind of test. In addition to swimming speeds, we can determine the amount of oxygen the fish needs while it's just resting. It's only devoting energy to basic maintenance costs, say at zero flow, uh, be kind of like you sitting on, on the couch doing absolutely nothing, not digesting, not thinking, not doing a thing. In, otherwise, in other words, it's kind of like it's resting metabolic rate. We can also determine um, the amount of oxygen that the fish needs at peak performance before fatigue. This is an estimate of its maximum metabolic rate. We can also determine how long it takes the fish to recover from exercise and how these metrics change under different conditions. The difference between the maximum and the resting metabolic rates is the fish's total scope for activity. This is in essence all of the energy the fish has to devote to all oxygen requiring activities that it needs to do in its environment, um, such as swimming, foraging, looking for a mate, hiding, and, and eating, maybe evading a predator. So when some sort of stress is added to the equation, this adds to the cost of maintaining the fish. It takes up valuable scope for activity and may reduce some of these other really important athletic traits like swimming. So my team and I work very carefully to select species and sites some of which can be analogs for future conditions like the gradient along the Great Barrier Reef and up into the Coral Triangle, um, some extreme conditions like what we find off of Magnetic Island, which is off of Townsville where I live, a lot of very unforgiving mangrove habitats. And we do have a few other um, spots where carbon dioxide is naturally coming up through volcanic activity up through the reefs, so that simulates future conditions as well. We can make comparisons, we can identify winners and losers, getting back to that whole athletic and sport performance, and we can try to predict the responses that some of these fish species and populations will have to future ocean conditions like warming, ocean acidification, changes in water quality, etc. But what happens when you see climate change happening right before your eyes? Here in the backdrop is a place called Lizard Island, it's the northern part of the Great Barrier Reef, and it's one of my most favorite places to work on the planet. Um, it's some of the most pristine parts of the Great Barrier Reef. And literally just over a couple weeks period of time, while a team of us were working right here in this exact spot last February, the summer temperatures rose to several degrees above average, and they remained that way for weeks. And the result of that, not just in this location, but actually globally, um, and definitely throughout the Great Barrier Reef, was the worst coral bleaching that the Great Barrier Reef has ever seen. And these were some of the headlines we started to see, some of which stemmed from discussions I had after witnessing underwater what was happening at Lizard Island. And by far the worst thermal event, and as a result, the worst coral bleaching that the Great Barrier Reef has ever faced. Truly a sobering experience for me to witness and for my students and my colleagues. So before I get back to what the fish might have been doing during this thermal event and what, what could have been happening during this, um, this whole cascade of, of elevated temperatures, what exactly is coral bleaching and why is it so bad? So in short, this is what's happening. A healthy coral consists of a, an animal, a coral animal, and it's symbiotic algae. Okay, so it's essentially two organisms living together. The algae uses photosynthesis to make food for the both of them, and the algae is also responsible for the beautiful, vibrant colors that we associate with a coral reef. 
When the coral as a whole gets stressed, um, which largely comes due to elevated temperatures, the algae will often leave the coral. The relationship breaks up. And if conditions do not improve, the algae is gone forever. And because the algae was so important for providing food and also oxygen to the coral animal, the coral will die of starvation. And what's left when that relationship breaks up is just a carbonate skeleton that's stark white. And that's where the idea or the, the name bleaching comes from. And over time, what will happen is macroalgae will colonize uh, this substrate and completely change the whole dynamics of this ecosystem. So we no longer have a, a beautiful coral reef anymore. Of course, this was not restricted to the Great Barrier Reef, as I mentioned, and did start as early as 2014, continuing through mid-2016 um, in the Caribbean and Florida, so a little bit closer to home here. Um, that's when they were seeing the worst of it as well. And it's thought that the Great Barrier Reef and places like Kiribati were the hardest hit. And I'll mention also that the Great Barrier Reef was bleached again this year. Data are still coming in, um, but we're starting to see the extent of that damage and it's not good. Back-to-back -back years of coral bleaching has never been seen ever in history, certainly not on the Great Barrier Reef. But worldwide, and especially for the Great Barrier Reef, um, it wasn't a surprise last year. Um, it was predicted by our Australian Bureau of Meteorology and your equivalent here, NOAA. And so we were prepared to start monitoring. On the Great Barrier Reef, we have now fully documented three mass coral bleaching events in less than two decades. And the data, I said, as, are coming in from the fourth one that just happened this year. Each of those bleaching events had unprecedented damage. Each of those bleaching events had a different footprint as well. And we also know that the areas that were bleached coincided with pockets of warm water. And that overall, the Great Barrier Reef is about one degree Celsius warmer than it has been since 2002. Last year was also an El Nino year, which we all know is a very natural cycle. It's predictable. Um, but it did exacerbate what was already happening with the elevated ocean temperatures because the warm water remained for a lot longer than it usually would. So the graph here that I'm showing is showing temperatures for the Coral Sea for all of the months of March since 1900. And February and March tend to be the warmest months on the Great Barrier Reef. That's our like late summertime. And the blue represent cooler than average temperatures and the orange represent warmer than average temperatures. And it, it is also in Fahrenheit, which nothing else has been in my presentation. <laughs> but um, what you can obviously see here is the, the past several decades have been warmer than average. So in September of 2015, the director of our Center of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies, where I'm based at James Cook University in Australia, put together the National Coral Bleaching Task Force. And this combined about 300 researchers from Australian and international institutions to start surveying before any of this started happening. We had the predictions that came in around May or so from both our Bureau and NOAA. So we were ready for this. And um, collections, surveys, analyses and a lot of brainstorming about what this might mean for the Great Barrier Reef and for coral reefs worldwide. So the numbers that I mentioned earlier and those that were in the headlines of all of the Washington Post and the New York Times um, came from the results from aerial surveys that our director and a lot of the other researchers in our in our center were doing that were also ground truth with underwater surveys. Um, over a thousand reefs, um, this makes up over a third of all of the reefs from the 2,300 kilometers that make up the whole Great Barrier Reef, which is about 1,500 miles, um, depends on who you ask, the size of Italy or the size of Germany. So a massive living organism. Over the entire stretch, only 7% of reefs completely escaped bleaching last year. And the surveys also revealed that the north, which is also where my beloved Lizard Island is, 
suffered the most damage, with about 81% of the reef severely bleached, and now we've documented it to about two-thirds complete mortality. The estimates for the entire system of the Great Barrier Reef are about a third, or about 35% mortality. And so, yes, this is doom and gloom. Um, this is very sad. Uh, our director, his first post on his Twitter feed was, and then we wept. Um, this is our livelihood. This is what we've built our careers for. So how do we think about this as positively as possible? Well, we weren't prepared to stop it from happening, but what we were prepared to do is to collect as much data as possible and compare it to past years, all of our very rigorous and controlled laboratory studies and events in other locations around the world. So while all of the surveyors were in the air and underwater and the coral specialists were um, collecting and analyzing samples, I led a group to determine what the fish were doing. So we were monitoring Lizard Island quite closely and we targeted sampling intervals for the beginning of December when temperatures were average for like an early austral summer. And when I arrived in early February, when water temperatures were really, really starting to warm up, you can see Lizard Island is pointed out on, on both of those there. Um, and waters were really starting to warm up. At the end of that month of February, we're starting to get daytime low tides. So really shallow water, um, getting really warm, say two, three o'clock in the afternoon. And so that was really exacerbating this, these warm water conditions even more, bringing in pockets of about 34 degrees Celsius. That's you know in the 90s Fahrenheit, and um, water that stayed around like that for a few days. And then into March, when the corals were really starting to show the dire consequences of the warm temperatures, and the warm water was becoming a lot more widespread. Indeed, the temperature buoys that we had set up showed us that for that year, last year, the red trace, um, temperatures were on average one to one and a half degrees Celsius above the last eight year average, which is in the black trace. And this was especially evident in February and March. We also went back to the site in July for our winter sampling as well, winter. So despite the bleaching and the soon dying corals, as you can see in the backdrop here, that stark white color that I was mentioning, the fish were still there. But what I wanted to do was find out the progression of changes that these fish, these athletes were making leading up to, during and following this transient temperature event that may or may not have allowed them to maintain key performance traits, their athleticism, and any potential trade-offs that were resulting. Because we had co coordinated this task force early on, uh, we were somewhat ready, um, it was still kind of a mad rush to get lots of supplies together, but we went out in December and we sampled nine target species, the same species from the same exact reefs in February when temperatures were quite warm, and again in March when the bleaching was in full effect. Then as I mentioned, we went back in July for our sort of winter sampling when water temperatures were supposed to be the coolest. They were still a little bit warmer than they should have been, but about 23, 24 degrees Celsius. So to put that into perspective about room temperatures, it doesn't get super cool on the Great Barrier Reef in the winter time. So this is a work in progress, but the coral surveys have been published already. And the cover of Nature a couple months ago said exactly that, reefs under threat. And my team and I have now spent the past year with different tissue samples, um, different analyses, different comparisons, and really hoping that we can describe what was happening with the fish. And luckily, we've been doing so many controlled laboratory experiments already simulating some of these conditions against which we can compare this system that was happening in the wild at this time. So before the coral bleaching and the associated extreme temperatures happened on the Great Barrier Reef last year, we knew that these extreme heating events have been becoming more and more frequent than ever. And as the atmosphere continues to warm and we continue our sort of business as usual conditions with emissions, this will only get worse. At the COP21 meeting in Paris, all of the countries involved 
discussed keeping carbon emissions down such that warming would not exceed one and a half, two degrees Celsius, which would be the green line here on this graph. But continuing as we are now, we're tracking along the red line. That one and a half degree Celsius threshold will arrive a lot sooner than we originally thought. And as you might remember, uh, I was mentioning what was happening on the Great Barrier Reef, where temperatures were about a degree warmer since 2002. So that's what happens with one degree warming on the Great Barrier Reef. Do we really want to get to one and a half degrees or even higher than that? And then if we take that to the fishes, what are the fishes doing with a one and a half degree increase in temperatures? So I'm gonna show a little bit of data in this light. Much of the temperature research that I've done so far has been on the Great Barrier Reef and into the Coral Triangle uh, up through Papua New Guinea because this is a perfect, perfect ge geographical gradient in temperatures with the warmest and the narrowest ranges of temperatures being close to the equator and the widest, most fluctuating temperatures being sort of in the southern Great Barrier Reef. Here we've got Heron Island. Uh, and for a point of reference, Lizard Island would fall sort of right in the middle of this whole cline here. The other great thing about this location is I can find the same fish species, although they're residing in different locations with different thermal regimes. And so I can harness this geographic gradient as an analog to climate change and compare these populations of fish species that are living in all of these different thermal locations. So with the projected temperature increases for the oceans this century, it's thought that species or populations that are living in the tropics, especially those that are close to the equator, with very narrow ranges of temperatures that they ever experience, will be the most vulnerable to warming. So what do these tropical and equatorial populations do as their habitat warms beyond the temperatures where they perform the best? Well, I say they go mad. They can move to a more hospitable habitat. They can adapt or essentially change their DNA over generations so that they're better equipped to cope with these conditions, or they die. The first two options are more likely and more preferred. And indeed, over 360 tropical coral reef fish species have already been shown to be moving and expanding their distribution ranges, moving to higher latitudes away from the equator. And this may be indeed what happens. So back to that question, what does a few degrees increase mean uh, in temperatures mean for fish performance? Here I've plotted the aerobic scope, so the total scope for performance for one species of reef fish called a cardinal fish. We studied this species um, or this population of this species uh, near the equator in Papua New Guinea. And the blue and pink box on this graph represents its normal range of temperatures that it experiences throughout its entire lifespan between about 28 and a half and 31 and a half degrees Celsius year round. So it's a very narrow range, two, three degrees that it ever experiences in its entire lifespan. The aerobic scope of this species doesn't change much within this range. However, if we uh, elevate temperatures, we know we're adding uh, stress to the basic maintenance costs for this fish, making it more expensive to be alive. And you can see a dramatic decline in scope with these elevated temperatures outside their normal range. This is up to a 72% decrease in performance in some species. This means that they now have less scope for all of those really critical ecological activities that require oxygen, like swimming and foraging and finding a mate and hiding. And we now know some of the reasons why these fish cannot perform at these warmer temperatures. In this case, these are electron micrographs of the gills. And what we've found is that the gills are not making the proper adjustments to keep getting enough oxygen into the fish's body at these elevated temperatures. So it's, it's too much, too fast, and they're not able to do it. And of course we know the gills or our lungs, pretty important for athletic performance, getting that oxygen to our bodies and helping that blood transported around to the tissues that need it. 
So let me take you back to that geographical gradient, three sites that we examined, and I'm picking out four species of fish that we found in all of these sites. And if we plot the temperature where their performance is the best, where they're the best athletes, each species, each site, interestingly, it's the same, despite the high latitude sites, in this case, Heron Island, the most southern part of the Great Barrier Reef, having a really wide seasonal temperature range, these fish are overprepared. They can perform at really high temperatures, but they don't really need it. The fish from near the equator, Papua New Guinea, as I mentioned earlier, would be in a bit of danger if their annual temperatures elevated by just a degree or two. They are really very much at the edge of their limits. And this can give us some indication as to some really vulnerable populations, especially regarding short-term events like the thermal stress that happened during the coral bleaching event. Probably the populations living in the north, closer to the equator, would be the most at risk during these types of events. So it'll be really interesting to compare all of those data collected from before, during, and after the coral bleaching event and draw some conclusions when we compare against these controlled laboratory studies. But although this is probably the biggest and most dangerous threat, elevated temperatures, it's not the only problem that our aquatic athletes are facing. Not only are greenhouse gases warming the oceans, but they're acidifying or decreasing the pH of the oceans as well. And the chemistry is pretty well understood. What we know is about a third of the carbon dioxide that's emitted into the atmosphere is being absorbed by the oceans. Now atmospheric carbon dioxide levels have increased by 1% in the 90s, but an additional 3% since the year 2000. This has resulted in carbon dioxide levels that have increased from 280 parts per million to over 400 parts per million. And this has all been since the Industrial Revolution. And for the first time in 800,000 years. So an 800,000 year record that's not really anything to be proud of. The carbon dioxide at the ocean surface depends on what happens in the atmosphere. And consequently, the carbon dioxide of the ocean is rising at the same rate as in the atmosphere. This has already resulted in a 0.1 pH unit decrease and with models predicting that the atmosphere will continue to warm, will exceed 900 parts per million by 2100, this will result in a further decrease in pH in the oceans by about 0.3 to 0.4 pH units, all of which of course is happening concurrently with ocean warming. So how do fish respond to ocean acidification? Now, we understand quite a bit of what other marine organisms, especially those that build a shell and how they do it. Um, organisms that have some sort of calcified structure, even like corals, we understand how they respond. And if you think back to some of the science fair experiments you might have done when you're young, you put a, a, you know, when you're losing your baby teeth, you put a tooth into a glass of Coca-Cola and it dissolves, they say overnight, but I'm not sure that's really true but it's a similar chemical concept. We understand this chemistry quite well, but we're just now starting to tease apart what this is meaning for fishes. What we do know is that when there is excess carbon dioxide in the water, fish have to make adjustments to balance their own pH inside their bodies. In fact, pH regulation is one of the most tightly regulated physiological processes in the entire animal kingdom. Changes in the pH of the blood and the pH of the cells can impact how oxygen binds to hemoglobin, okay? So that critical process that allows for athletic performance of these fishes. It can alter protein charge and the consequences for protein function can impair everything from enzyme function, vitamin and nutrient transport, muscle contractions and metabolism through to survival. But it turns out that fish are quite good at these adjustments, such that there's limited effects of high carbon dioxide on nearly every life history, growth, development, and survival trait. Even up through adulthood, the athletic capacity of fish exposed to these conditions is relatively unchanged. And this is really good news, 
But we are starting to see some trade-offs in terms of behavioral traits. Fish exposed to near future carbon dioxide levels have trouble distinguishing the smell of a predator, sounds of their homes. They're unable to properly respond to visual threats and are more bold or daring. And their learning abilities can become impaired as well. So we're just now starting to understand that when fish try to regulate their whole body pH, which they can do really, really well, many traits will respond well, uh, such as athletic performance, but the internal imbalances also alter a key neurotransmitter in the brain that impacts behavior. So while they're growing and developing properly, maintaining their athleticism, they're making poor decisions. And maybe we could think of some of our elite athletes that, may, that make poor decisions as well. So this isn't the, the case for all species. And ocean acidification, of course, isn't the only thing that's happening to the oceans, as I keep mentioning. Back to our four main changes that are happening to the oceans with climate change and thinking that each one is bad enough alone, but they are all occurring in combination. My lab is also looking quite closely at how oxygen, um, low oxygen areas, and the changes that fish are making to make changes and acclimate to um, low oxygen areas. We've got a large team of students and postdocs that are looking at the effects of declining water quality, specifically turbidity and the effects of sediment runoff on larval fish, for which I'll touch on briefly before wrapping up. So this is another big problem, as if the Great Barrier Reef needs more, but this is another big problem on the Great Barrier Reef where humans um, and human activities are really greatly influencing water quality. A large part of the natural vegetation on the Great Barrier Reef uh, catchment area has been modified by cattle grazing, um, agriculture, infrastructure, such as roads and buildings, and this is all increasing soil erosion. The amount of sediment that's transported offshore um, by flood plumes is increasing, and there's a lot of um, sediment that's transported back to shore as well. Uh, this is all increased by about five to eight times since the European settlement. And once the sediment is in the water, all kinds of conditions and processes can resuspend that sediment um, until they're deposited in, into deeper waters. Dredging for ports and shipping channels is further increasing sediment resuspension. And of course, climate change, elevations in temperatures uh, is predicted to further increase erosion and sediment resuspension. It turns out that sediment and turbidity can be a really big problem for larval reef fishes. Essentially, it makes it harder for their gills to take up oxygen. And given these results, you can imagine how many directions we need to take this research now. And that's what uh, a few of my students are, in fact, doing. And so we do have a lot going on to try to understand how the evolutionary history and the environmental influences of fish are influencing their capacity to survive and thrive in the Anthropocene. We're looking at different life stages. We're comparing uh, reef dwellers to non-reef dwellers, uh, diurnal or daytime species versus nocturnal species. And we're definitely comparing our really athletic versus our sluggish species as well. And as a very close to home example, um, UMass Boston and of course New England Aquarium PhD student Carolyn, who's here today, um, is looking at the effects of elevated temperatures on the epaulette shark development, which can be really telling as they develop in eggs for about 100, 140 days or so. So if they can't escape those challenging conditions while they're developing an egg, um, that could be a really big problem for this particular species of shark, which is an important um, component of many coral reef ecosystems. So keep an eye on what's happening here at the aquarium. Um, but indeed, all in all, we have a lot of work to do um, in the future. My team, uh, we're very busy. We have a lot to keep us occupied and huge questions to answer regarding uh, the interactions between elevated temperature, carbon dioxide, some of these key athletic and performance traits, other climate drivers, a lot more on turbidity and sediment. And we're also getting into sound pollution and just sort of hot off the press, 
boat noise is increasing the heart rate of larval reef fishes, so that could be an issue as well. Um, and uh, the mechanisms that are involved in maintaining critical processes like oxygen transport and the trade-offs between athletic performance and proper behavior. The role of the environment and gradients. Um, we can study to learn more about what animals are doing and finally taking into consideration evolution and adaptation the key genes that will be involved in the future of reef fishes in the face of climate change in the Anthropocene. So I hope that I've bridged my curiosity um, for oxygen transport and athletes and especially athletic fish to understand um, what makes these fish such incredible athletes uh, and bridging that with some approaches to asking and answering questions that are important to these massive issues that we're facing as the planet uh, goes into the Anthropocene. Um, climate change being a big one of these and events such as the mass coral bleaching that we've been facing globally. So I'll leave you with a quote from one of my role model female marine biologists, Dr. Sylvia Earle. Indeed, the next 10 years are going to be the most important in the next 10,000. Absolutely. And it's going to be this curiosity-driven fundamental research that we need to apply our findings to try to solve some of these contemporary issues, making information and findings accessible to the intended audiences, to people like yourselves, so that change can happen and inspiring the next generation of scientists and communicators. Um, that's what's needed to save the oceans, the coral reefs, and to make sure, in my biased opinion, that fish remain the greatest athletes on the planet. Thank you. So we have time for some questions for Dr. Rummer. If you could just repeat the questions sure. as they come in. Yes. That's a great question. So the question was, how long can the fish survive if the coral dies? And we were having a conversation about this earlier. There are some fish species that are extremely specific to a species of coral. And so if that's the case, if they can't find another coral of that species to inhabit, then that, that fish will reach its demise as well. There are other coral reef fish species that aren't as picky about the coral they need to be on, and maybe they could inhabit or colonize a different coral if one is available. But a lot of these coral reef fishes need the coral for structure. The coral can also provide food. We have a lot of coralivores that eat coral as well. And a lot of the algae that is around coral is also important for other fish species. So it's really about making sure that another habitat is available that they can go to if they can't reside on the one they're currently on. Yes? Well, that's a great question as well. So um, the question is uh, experimenting on a fish outside of all of the other ecological processes and environmental processes that are happening for that fish. And so, you know, that's, that's really where we could start to isolate which of these different conditions or mechanisms are maybe most important or most influential. Um, uh, controlling for everything else except for maybe temperature or except for carbon dioxide. And then we can look back at the organism in its environment and say, okay, well, they are not performing as well as usual. We know that temperature definitely influences that and sort of take that back into the organism and its habitat. An organism and its habitat cannot be disconnected. We know that it's a, it is a product of its environment, but it's really through those laboratory experiments that we can start to highlight and identify which mechanisms are most important in driving those changes or those responses for those organisms. So the question is, what's the recovery time? What's the regrowth? And it depends on the species. We do have some species that are super corals, maybe more robust than others but we're looking at about a 10 year recovery period. So that's when it gets really scary when we've got back to back bleaching events like this. And so I can elaborate a little bit more on that in that the entire stretch of the Great Barrier Reef, uh, it was the northern part last year that really got heavily hit. And it wasn't expected um, by sort of the general uh, consensus because that's the pristine area of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, there's not a lot of agricultural runoff. There's not a lot of human influence. So it should be okay, right? Well, 
it's still getting the warm water. It's not immune to the warm water. But what we can look at is that all of those challenging conditions like a lot of runoff or a lot of, uh, um, a lot of traffic or boat noise or any of these other issues will impede its recovery. So uh, if we do have heavily protected areas, then they could recover a little bit faster, but those types of conditions aren't protecting the, the coral reefs from bleaching. So yeah, about, about 10 years. We, um, this year with the bleaching that happened again, we got areas that didn't get bleached last year and they're dead now. So, thank you. Thank you. Has there, um, has there been more local and political support for controlling things like agricultural runoff? I know there's high sugar cane production and a lot of fertilizer that's used and things like that. Has there been more support given the economic uh, sort of carrier the Great Barrier Reef is? Yes and no. So yes, the Great Barrier Reef is a, is a huge economic carrier for Australia. It's the icon of Australia. And when you think of Australia, you think of what, the Opera House, the Great Barrier Reef, kangaroos, right? So um, you would think, you know, we have two million visitors that come just to see and snorkel and dive on the reef every year. Um, it's hundreds of thousands of jobs that are being supported and then not to account for um, the fish that come from the reef that people are eating, uh, not just in Australia, but also in other places. So yes, you would think that would be happening. Um, I, I talked about it earlier today with a few people that we feel like band-aids are being put on arterial wounds. So yes, a lot of these, these other issues are important to curb, but they're also sort of quick little fixes that aren't addressing the big problem. So yes, uh, there's an amazing group called Greening Australia that Sir Richard Branson has just endorsed um, that I was lucky to be a part of as well. So uh, you know, several hundred million dollars have gone into coastal restoration to make sure that runoff isn't going into the Great Barrier Reef. And you know, our little Nemo has been uh, the <laughs> The, the, poster, the poster fish for that, for that project as well, and um, really getting that information out there as to how we can use natural um, landscapes to help that erosion process and curb that erosion process and what that type of erosion means to coral reefs and to coral reef fishes that are inhabiting those areas. That's all extremely important and we can't stop doing that, but what it does seem like to me with our administration, maybe not that unlike yours right now, is that it's those are the quick little fixes and we just don't want to address the big issue. The elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, yes? Could you compare the effect of acidification on the corals uh, versus just the warming effects? Is acidification making it more difficult for the corals to form the, the skeletons? The chemistry around that, yes. So it will make it more difficult, maybe more energetically costly for the corals to form their, their carbonate skeleton, so to speak. Um, but really, temperature is, is the one. It's the one that's the most stressful to the corals, to the fishes, to pretty much every uh, organism that makes up a coral reef. It's, it's probably the most profound. Yes? Thank you for the lecture. Um, Thank you. My question is, uh, do you know uh, if the ex existence of a new coral reef discovered on the mouth of the Amazon is real? I have heard about the new coral reef that was discovered at the mouth of the Amazon, and that's really interesting because that's probably not the most pristine looking conditions at the mouth of you know, the Amazon River. Um, so that will be really interesting to look at over uh, the next few years, uh, how are those corals coping with probably not super favorable conditions, and and what are they like? Um, you know, down to the molecular level, what makes these tough corals? Uh, so yes, I have heard about it. It will be interesting to see how that unfolds over the next few years, and the amazing scientists that I'm sure are absolutely on task. Yes. 
Yeah, so the question is about the, um, just which types of fishes are maybe changing, different trophic levels, different jobs that the fishes have, and, and how bleaching has affected that. And I can't say with um, any definitive answers yet, but that is what we're thinking. Um, so our sort of middle predators and our important grazers and uh, algae eaters that would maybe protect those coral reefs from being overtaken by that turf algae, uh, we, we might see them compromised as well because the, the warm temperatures are affecting them and it's making them more difficult to, to be alive, more expensive to be alive as well. So we do have a lot of research looking at that um, and watch this space. Last question. Up at the top? That's a great question. So it's, uh, the question is regarding how we document how the fish is acclimating to warmer temperatures over time. Um, from a behavioral perspective, just a lot of observations over time. Um, so we do some experiments where we're looking to see if the fish prefers warmer temperatures or cooler temperatures, and that's very much a behavioral response, but it's all fueled by the physiological and biochemical mechanisms that are happening in the body. And those are mechanisms that we can track over time as well by taking blood samples or taking tissue biopsies and looking at key traits related to performance, like anything related to oxygen transport in the blood, metabolic enzymes in the muscles, and we can look at even samples of the gill to see how the gill is changing over time as well. So everything that's important for maintaining performance and getting enough oxygen into the body and delivered to the tissues while the fish is experiencing these more challenging conditions over time, we can sample these fish over uh, you know, every other day, every other week, and we just actually finished a, an experiment where we sampled so, uh, 19 or 20 different metrics over time to see which ones were happening first, which ones took a little bit longer to happen, and what was the overall time scale of that to occur. So that can tell us a lot, though, about how fast they can cope when uh, we start to get these daytime low tides and the corals start bleaching because the temperatures are staying warm for a long period of time. Um, if they stay warm for a couple weeks, is that enough for them to make all those adjustments? No, it's not. <laughs>